Hello, sophomores. I hope that you guys are having a beautiful week. Last week, we had the opportunity to sit around and spend some time looking at this enigmatic figure, John the Baptist. And then we also took a, some, a moment to, to notice that Jesus is moving into the desert in this time of temptation, right? And the key thing I wanted you to walk away from that uh, with is this idea that Jesus is somehow fixing all the things that the Jewish people did wrong, that he's unbreaking all of history, right? Every temptation that the Jewish people had in the desert, he's doing it right. And notice something else. How does it begin? Well, Jesus passes through the waters of the Jordan, right? Uh, uh, he goes through the waters of the Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. When else do we see somebody going through the waters? Well, we see the Israelite people going through the waters, through the Red Sea, right? They walk through the Red Sea. Jesus walks through the, through the Jordan River. They walk into the desert. Jesus walks into the desert. There they're tempted. Jesus is tempted. There they fall. Here Jesus does not fall. He, he resists all of those temptations. So we see, as we look at Matthew, as we look at, uh, especially in Matthew, rather, but as we see Jesus moving through, starting to move into his public ministry, the very first thing he does is he writes all the wrongs of the past, right? An important thing to note. Today, what I wanted to talk about is uh, what, what happens next. So here, um, let me make sure I'm getting this right. All right, I, I want to highlight two things. One, I would like to highlight um, this idea of gathering apostles, Right, gathering disciples, people who are going to follow him. And then the second thing I want to talk about is um, Jesus as, as, as a miracle worker. Right, He does all these miracles. So let's start with the first thing. I'd like to, um, I've got my Bible here, and I'd like to spend just a second um, seeing, seeing a call. How does he call these disciples? Well, I'm going to go specifically by looking at the call of Matthew. Matthew's just one of the many he's calling. But I want to take a look at this one, because I think this one's kind of indicative of, of what's happening across the board. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the customs post. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. While he was at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat with Jesus and his disciples. The Pharisees saw this and said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He heard this and said, Those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn the meaning of the words, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. So let's take a look at this moment. We have this, we have this thing happening, right? Jesus already has some disciples. They're, most of them are fishermen. But he's walking through town. And he sees Matthew. And Matthew is a tax collector. I mean, this is like the lowest of the low. Um, I'm not sure we even have an equivalent in, in, in our country of, of how just low this was. This was the job of a traitor, right? Um, realize that the country was owned by, by another country, Rome. And Rome inflicted rule upon, upon the Israelite people, and they hated it. They hated them. They hated the way they made them do things. Um, they, 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 they didn't care about, their, about the way they worshipped God. They, they just, it was a bad deal all around. So tax collectors were people that worked for Rome by taking the Israelites' money. This is not a popular position. This is seen as a total and complete traitor. And Matthew is one of these traitors. So he's making bank, but no one in town respects him. They spit on him as he walks by. He's considered to be the, the lowest of the low. And Jesus, walking through town, sees Matthew. And he tells Matthew, follow me. And not only does he say, follow me, he also invites Matthew, he also asks Matthew to take him to his home, where he eats and drinks along with all of his disciples with the people that Matthew hang out with. Other tax collectors. Other people that the community hates. Like, if everybody hates you, you're going to hang out with other people who everybody hates. 
And that's exactly who Jesus spends this dinner with. Now, the righteous people, the people who are like really religious and like trying to do, you know, they're really actually probably not bad people. But they see this and they're like, wait a minute. One minute I see Jesus as a holy man and the next minute he's with the literally the worst people that we know. And Jesus says, I've come to heal everybody. In fact, I've come especially for those who are far away. I didn't come to heal the ones who are well. I came to heal the ones who were sick. Right? And Matthew is one of these. But really, aren't we all? Right? I mean, we're all a little backwards. We're all not following God the way he would have us follow him, including those who, who are acting so righteous. In fact, later on, he'll call them hypocrites. He'll say, you know, hey, you guys say you're, you're, you're trying to follow the Lord, but you're not. You're holding the Lord away from others. You're making rules and, and regulations that nobody can get past. This is, what you're doing is insane, right? But he calls Matthew. He calls Matthew to himself. Now, Matthew, to this day, is known as the tax collector. And during, during all of his time as, in, in, as, as, as an apostle, he was looked down on because of the job he used to have. And Jesus brought him along with him anyways. This is all of the apostles. The apostles are simple men. So what does Jesus do? How does he find them? Well, Jesus walks around and he's giving teaching and he sees people. And for some reason, he chooses these specific people to be the ones who are going to follow him closely. Now, don't get me wrong. There were a lot of people following Jesus. They, everywhere he went, there was a crowd. And there were a lot of uh, disciples who weren't the apostles who would, who would follow Jesus around too. But these special 12, these special 12 followed him everywhere, did every single thing he did. He and he taught them from his own mouth, in his own hand, sat around the fire at night with them. Um, these, these 12 people he spent special. And they had the opportunity to witness everything that Jesus did. Now, here's an important thing to notice. You can fool people. It, people fool people all the time. But what Jesus did was something different. Jesus pulled these 12 people and had them live with him day in, day out, every day. They ate, drank, slept together for three years. Three years. And at the end of that three years, they didn't think, well, you know, Jesus is a great guy, but, you know, he's pulling some tricks here and there. Actually, quite the opposite. The longer they got to know him, the more they realized that he was something completely different than any other human who'd walked the face of the earth. They realized very quickly um, that he was miraculous. But by the end of it, they recognized that he was God himself because nobody could be like he was, right? He was, he was something completely different. And it shook all 12 of these men. These 12 men will move as witnesses throughout the world after Jesus' death. So it's important to understand what their life was like. For these three years, they spent every waking moment with Jesus for three years. Jesus didn't get to go off and, and do things on his own. Every moment, they were there. Watching, seeing what he did, seeing how he acted, watching it all. So when they give us accounts of miracles, these are, these are accounts directly from them. I want to point something out. A lot of people make the mistake as we look at Jesus' miracles of thinking that they're somehow legends or that they're a folklore of some kind or that they grew over time. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, as we look at the gospel accounts, as we look at the writings that came directly from these apostles, one of them, Matthew, another one, John, was written directly by one of the men sitting there who watched all these things happen. What we see is something very different from any miracle story ever told, either before or after. You see, first of all, we see these miracles are all put into the most real and mundane situations. Normally, when you're looking at miracle workers throughout history, miracle workers are all about 
creating a big show, right? Showing their power. So it's like a backup for their words, right? Jesus doesn't use miracles as a backup for his words. Well, he does once, but he usually doesn't, right? He just does them. But he's not trying to show off at all. He's not a magician at all. In fact, many of his opponents would turn to him and they would attack him, right? Now, here's something that's interesting. He's doing a miracle and he's getting attacked for it. Let me give you an example. This one comes from the Gospel of Mark. Mark is, uh, in, in the Gospel of Mark, um, we see uh, 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 Jesus is performing a miracle. And the Pharisees who are there, who see it, accuse him of doing miracles by the power of the devil. Now, if your job is to show that Jesus is the great miracle worker, what you're not going to do is show a bunch of people who are going against that and saying, no, 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 no. And even more interesting, when they do, notice that these Pharisees aren't denying that he's doing a miracle. They, it's common knowledge. They see that he's doing these incredible works, right? That, 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 that these are miraculous things. What they're doing is they're accusing his theology. They're saying, look, yeah, we see that you're doing incredible things, but you're doing them by the power of evil, not by the power of good. Well, this is interesting because it shows these two things. One, that even his enemies recognized that these miracles were real. Two, it shows that the apostles are not afraid of that conflict, right? That the apostles are not afraid to just tell it exactly like it was. They're not trying to sway us in any way. They're just telling us the story. So that's one reason why we can we can respect, you know, look at these miracles and not see them as legends. The other reason we can look at these miracles and not see them as legends or as folklore is because of their dissimilarity with every other kind of legend and folklore that we have, either Jewish or pagan. Doesn't matter. All miracle workers follow certain certain kinds of work. Um, most often, the most important being that they're trying to make sure that everyone sees that they're a miracle worker, right? They're doing these things very, very publicly in, in order to show off. And Jesus does quite the opposite. He doesn't show off at all. In fact, when he's asked to show off, he refuses over and over and over again. Everybody's heard of the miracles he does. It's not some, it's not some secret in this, in this time frame. And yet, when he's put to the test, he says, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a puppet. I'm not a magician. I'm not here to show off for you. For example, King Herod uh, requests him to show off his power. He refuses, right? He gets frustrated with the, with, the, with the Pharisees. They're constantly saying, well, give us a sign. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, Satan, you remember last week, we were looking at the, at the, in, the, in the desert, and he said, do a miracle for me. Make this bread, make this stone into bread. And he says, no, I'm not doing it. Um, he asks his, he asks all the people who are he's doing miracles for more often than not he's asking them to be silent say please keep this to yourself go do what you're supposed to do I'm just here to take care of you the other thing is he doesn't he's not showy about his miracles at all like normally when you see in history you see a miracle worker there there's there's all sorts of hand motions and I'm gonna bring down the power of whatever and it's gonna be beautiful and here it is right no Jesus does none of that. Jesus looks at the man who can't move and says, rise, take up your pallet and walk. That's all he does. Little girl, I say to you, arise. No magic words, no calling of, 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 of incredible. Nope, just by his own authority, by his own words, he just tells people to do what what is miraculous, and they do it. They're just healed. They're just fixed. There's no show. He just does it. This is so different from anything like what we have in any other culture, in any, even, even the Jewish culture. This is completely different than what, what, what has ever been seen, right? But either before or after, none of it. He just does it. So let's take a look at some of these miracles. Um, there's a lot of different miracles. Um, I'd like to focus on a few that are especially important, right? 
um, to make sure you know about them. The first one I want to share with you is Jesus calming the storm at sea. So here's what's happening. Jesus and his disciples are going across the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee, it's um, kind of like kind of like Lake Tahoe. It's a, it's, it's a, big, it's a big body of water, um, but it's not like the ocean. However, when storms come up on it, it is wild. I mean, with a with smaller body of water the, the, and the way that the, the, the land is formed there, it just rips through it. So they're going across this, um, going across the Sea of Galilee in a boat. Now, look, most of the people in the boat are fishermen. These people know the water. They've been out in storms many, many, many times. They've gone out and they fish right through them. I mean, come on, fishermen know the water. They know what they're doing. But they're scared for their life because out in the middle of the water, they suddenly have this massive storm, right? I'm talking so, so massive that the people who are the saltiest sailors they have are freaking out, worried they're all going to die. And they look at Jesus, and Jesus is sitting in the bow of the boat, completely asleep. Just totally and completely asleep. And they're like, we're going to die. And he's sleeping over there. So they wake him up to let him know we're going down. You know, and Jesus gets up and he looks at them. And he says, ye of little faith. And he, he immediately calms the winds and calms the waves and is suddenly still. And they're going across the water. Oh, ye of little faith. And he goes back to sleep. Why is this an important miracle? Because this miracle, more than any other, reminds us that God has our back. That he's with us all the time. Right? That there's, that there's nothing outside of God's plan. Right? That God, God knows the situation that you're in completely and totally. There's nothing to worry about. Right? That's an important thing to know. And we learn this not from Jesus' actions, but from his words. Notice the actions are just there to show that the words are real. Right? Don't worry about things. It's all going to be fine. God is in heaven and has us, knows what's happening, and it's fine. Calm down. Here's proof, right? That's one miracle I'd like you to know. Another one I want to make sure you're aware of is this moment that where, where Jesus um, feeds thousands of people. Now, they're off in the desert, and they've got his, the crowds have gotten so big he can't come to town anymore. He has to stay out in the middle of nowhere because if he came to town, it would wreck the town. Thousands of people are all around him. So he's out in the mountains or out in the desert, and he's, 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 he's preaching and, and sharing, you know, the good news with all these thousands of people. And he turns to the apostles and says, uh, or the apostles turn to him, and they say, um, Jesus, you got to send them home. We, they're going to starve out here. We, they, they need to go get some food. And Jesus, you can almost see him smirk. Jesus uh, tells them, go feed them yourselves. And they're like, if we worked, if all of us worked for a year, it wouldn't make up enough money to buy food for everybody here. And Jesus, and, and one, one, of the, one of the disciples, I'll never forget this, Andrew. Andrew turns to Jesus and says, well, there is this boy here who has some fish and has some loaves. I don't know what we could do with that. Andrew must be stupid, right? <laughs> what's, what's he supposed to do? What's, we have a few fish and a few loaves for thousands of people. Why did he even mention it? I don't know. But something about being spending this time with Jesus has, has changed these guys. And he turns to him and he says, I got a few fish and a few loaves from this young boy here. He brings this boy's gifts to Jesus. And there Jesus blesses those gifts and multiplies that food to feed everyone. Why is this such a big deal? Well, this is a big deal for a few reasons. 
one, you know, is is knowing that um, we God has the power to um, um, that God will always provide for us, right? That he, that God's never going to leave. That you never have to worry about you know whether or not you're going to be provided for everything that you need. God will provide. Um, I see people worrying all the time about all sorts of things. And it's a real shame because there's no need, right? Um, the way Jesus puts it is he says, think of the lilies in the field. Think of the birds in the air. They don't work. They don't do anything. And yet they have everything they need. You th what, you think God's not going to, if God knows every one of them, don't you think he knows the situations that you're in? You're fine. And we are. We are. I want to talk about so many more miracles. I want to talk about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. I want to talk about turning the water into wine. I want to talk about where Jesus walks on water. I want to talk about where he, he cures lepers and he, 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 heals, he heals people who are broken. I, I want to talk about miracles a lot, but we've already gone a good while. And so I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on your homework. So what I want you to, what I want to make sure you understand though, is that Jesus is miraculous in his teaching. Everything he does, everything he touches is touched with the divine. And these men saw him do this over and over and over and over and over and over again. They were astounded by him and did not know how to deal with him. He was something completely different. Um, so yeah, Jesus calls the disciples. Jesus works miracles. Next week, we're going to talk about some of the miracles, um, especially those that have to do with healing. You know, I want to, I want to take a look at the healing power of Jesus. Um, but other than that, I hope that God blesses you. I hope you guys have a beautiful week, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good one. Bye.